Well, hello, hello, everybody. Uh, thank you for all those that are tuning in. Really excited for today's episode. Uh, we have some very special guests, uh, Sam, the co-founder of Move, and also one of the co-founders at Missin Labs, and Rushi, who is the co-founder of Movement Labs. Uh, really excited to have you on, both gentlemen. Maybe just before we dive into all the nitty gritty on the tech side, can you just do a brief intro? I think, Sam, you've been on the podcast now a couple times. Uh, maybe if we could kick it off, Rushi, you just do a quick intro and then we'll pass it over to Sam. Yeah, I'm a first timer, so thanks for having me. Um, yeah, I'm co-founder of Movement Labs. My background is engineering, so been a nerd since I was a kid. Um, always was involved with distributed systems, systems at United Health Group. Got into crypto, started engineering here and there. Um, stumbled across this move language thing, which I was like, wow, a Facebook and a DM project is like putting so much resources. Got really excited. I actually built the first DEX in Aptos. My co founder built the first Yield Aggregate in Aptos um, and really wanted to extend the adoption of move and make it a standard for the future of smart contract development. Amazing. Cool. Yeah, I'm the co founder and CTO of Mist and Labs and the creator of move. I started off my career as a programming language, a static analysis and verification researcher. Uh, did a PhD working on building scalable static analyzers, went to Facebook and worked on static analysis with Facebook for a number of years uh, while doing that, uh, finding lots of bugs, developed a lot of opinions about how to create safer languages that avoid bugs by construction, got the opportunity to join Libra and create Move and then work on a lot of the execution layer and tech behind Libra and then hopped out with a, a number of my colleagues to uh, found Mist and Labs in 2021 and we launched SWE in 2023, uh, May of this year. Perfect. Well, maybe Sam, to start it off, why kind of start a new programming language? Why not use Solidity? Uh, Rust kind of started to gain some of the popularity for high performance blockchains. What was the thought process behind creating a new programming language that you just found that you, the gap in the market that you really needed to fill? Yeah, it's a really good question to ask because I think basically like the creating a new programming language is something that you should almost never do. It's definitely sort of like an anti-goal. Uh, there's this funny, I'll send it so the listeners can see afterward, like checklist of like reasons why you don't need to create this language. And then, you know, it'll, uh, it'll have all these things. So when, when I joined Libra, actually, my, I've been playing a lot with Rust and my instinct was actually like, oh, like, you know, let, let's use Rust. It has a lot of the properties that you would want in a language for smart contracts. Like it has this notion of scarcity. It has this distinction of like borrowing versus ownership. Like these are all things that are very relevant with real assets. The reason we ended up not going that direction is that, well, these properties hold at the source level when you're playing with the Rust compiler, but when you're actually gonna run the code, it compiles into it compiles into LLVM and then the machine code, and you're not gonna run the Rust compiler on chain. That's gonna be quite expensive and it would have to be deterministic as well. So really like you want something that has properties like that, but these properties can be checked at the bytecode level, not just at the source level. And then the other thing is that Rust is a general purpose language. Uh, it's used for the low systems programming. You can use it to write applications. Um, you can you can do all sorts of things with it. They sort of don't have a specific niche that they're trying to hit. Whereas smart contracts are a very, very idiosyncratic and much smaller kind of program. Like they only do a few kinds of things. Like you transfer, create, and share assets and you check access control properties. That's it. You're not gonna be writing compilers. <laughs> You're not gonna be like building a system. You're not doing file IO. So really like you wanna build a language. I think, and this is a good time to create a new language where it's like you have an emerging application domain you don't have something that really fits what programmers in that application domain are trying to do. And you have an idea of how you can express those fundamental abstractions better than what's out there. And so that was the, you know, Solidity was out there, but we felt like, you know, we see what folks are trying to do with this. This isn't done in a way that's as safe or as productive as it can be. And so we're going to take some of these rust ideas with what we've seen people try to do with Solidity and that's where move came from. And I, I think, I mean, we've kind of, talked about this a good amount in our past podcast definitely recommend those that have not listened to them to check them out but it's really like there's a lot of brilliant people within crypto a lot of brilliant people within web3 on the engineering side and some of these kind of re-entrancy bugs happen over and over again uh, and they're very hard to kind of abstract because they're just not baked into like the core programming language. Um, maybe passing it over to you, Rushi, was there anything particular that caught your eye about deciding to build movement labs and using the move programming language or move VM as well, uh, when you decided to check out the different landscapes and really decide what you wanted to contribute to the industry? 
yeah, I think I had come from a point of view where I was just a lowly engineer and just like tinkering around with different blockchains. And I was like building on Ethereum at one point. A, the fees were so ridiculous for I was trying to build like a paralyzed aura book. Um, and B, there's obviously like no paralyzed VMs on Ethereum at the time. This was like a year and a half ago, I want to say. Um, and like the gas fees were so high. But on the security side, I was like, didn't have a lot of capital. I was like a college kid, like eating ramen in my basement. Um, so I was like, I can't afford these auditing fees to like even get my app on mainnet. And then B, when I'm trying to like deploy like, these apps, um, I look, like, if you look at the Kyber attack, right? It was like a 0.00001% chance you could pick that up. And like now you have a Kyber dictator on that, like running the entire app. Um, so when you think about the landscape of, okay, if I'm trying to spend resources and actual time on building a DeFi app, a gaming app and pushing it to mainnet, me as like a single developer without like a big team, I'm probably not going to be able to catch like all these different edge cases in Solidity that like an Aave or these big blue chip protocols can. And even in those situations, we've seen like major DeFi hacks like Curve Attack, the Kyber Attack, pretty much every big attack is crippling the industry. So the thesis when people ask like, why move? Why are you so bullish on? Like, because you need to, right? If you're ever going to buy this thesis that like millions of people are going to use blockchains and like you know, millions of developers come to the ecosystem, they're not going to write Solidity because the barrier to entry is so high. When you look at any consumer apps that are built on Web2, you could push code, um, think like Zuckerberg in his college dorm, you could push code and not have to necessarily worry about it getting hacked and like losing millions of data. Um, with Move, it's finally a solution for that where you can, increase the production of velocity or velocity production. And maybe to that, one of the kind of the criticisms that I hear of new virtual machines or specifically new programming languages is like Solidity already has a moat. All the kind of engineers that are interested in Web3 are building on Solidity. Maybe to both of you, what is kind of your pushback or um, answer to the question that Solidity has already won? So I think these network effects are overstated just because the overall Web3 developer community is so small. Like, I think if you look at, like, say, Electric Capital's numbers, which are the best ones I know of, I think there's 16,000 full-time Web3 developers. That is a tiny, tiny number compared to conventional developer communities. If you look at the iOS developers, I think there's 12 million. If you look at JavaScript development, there's 16 million. You know, this is many orders of magnitude larger than the Web3 community. So, you know, all of us are interested in increasing the, the number of what the use cases there are, growing the community of users, growing the community of developers. So if we're going to, if this is going to become a real thing, we're going to need a lot more than 16,000 developers. And so like, you know, if we get to, if we get to hundreds of thousands of developers, millions of developers, that 16,000 is a rounding error. And then also there's a better technical solution, like, or, you know, obviously very biased, but I think Move is more productive. I think it's safer. And I think a lot of Solidity programmers are very interested in it and are just stuck with the baggage of being on these existing platforms where that's the only choice they have. So I think both of those things make me think like that it is not it is like not even close to too late to to change things. I think uh, sixteen thousand is even less engineers that Meta has directly. <laughs> a lot less. <laughs> yeah, I think when people say like the EVM is one, I'm like, okay, what do they win? Like you got like five apps, you got like five users on chain, like ten thousand developers. Like if in this hundred year landscape of like blockchains, it's very very small and minute. I think the way we address it is with we built a transpar essentially. That takes slowly op, slowly script, slowly opcodes, and maps it to the move VM, similar to like Solang on Solana, um, and that's also like an area of collaboration potentially with the Swedish system, where we can bring even compatibility compatibility to the move network to solve for the short term network effects, especially in bear markets where resources are difficult. Um, I think the concept of network effects and like sticky liquidity is a bear market principle. Right? Obviously, Sui launched in the bear market. Move was actually like launched in the bear market and still is doing really well i think it's very like forgotten it's like yeah we launched like after ftx went down right um probably not the best situation and even then we're seeing people actually pick up the language so especially in bear markets when time is like tough like experimentation is limited so in those events people are going to flock to the evm and say like the evm has won but when there is liquidity in the system when you look at a 10-year landscape there's more experimentation which is actually what the module thesis allows which i'll get more into later um but essentially the way we approach it is the short term sure we'll pro provide evm compatibility not the exact way we want to go about it but it's how you get over the stubborn people on twitter and like the mind share right and long term we're working with we working with other folks to really establish move as a dominant execution environment for the next 10 to 20 years and i think maybe that's a perfect segue ultimately 
historically, I feel like the entire blockchain industry has really been focused on the Ethereum virtual machine, which I think everybody in this kind of live stream can probably appreciate uh, is not the most optimized. There's a lot of things to ultimately be desired. But I think today what is amazing is the conversation is really shifting to single threaded virtual machines that cannot do parallel processing to parallel processing virtual machines. And I think within that, uh, move has kind of become front and similar front and center as well as kind of the Solana virtual machine. But within that, you can even go even deeper into the different types of kind of move programming language, um, even the move VMs. Maybe to Sam, can you talk a little bit about specifically the SWE uh, move and what kind of uh, advantages that SWE move has versus others, or maybe even compare and contrast there? Yeah, so I think the easiest way for this is to start with this, this to start with the story of like how Move evolved to where it is today. So you know the language started in 2018 at Facebook. I was a creator. Of it. We added a bunch of folks uh, as part of DM. We evolved Move. Uh, DM was supposed to be a compliant payment system. We added a lot of features that were for generic programming. We added a lot of features that were somewhat specific to that use case of implementing a compliant payment system. When I hopped out to start Miston with my co-founders in late 2021. We took a look at launching DM as is, and we looked at, well, this is a compliance payment system we want to build uh, that is supposed to run on a single box. We want to build a horizontally scalable smart contract platform that allows arbitrary programmability. So we took a front scratch look at all the aspects of DM and that included move, like, you know, which parts of this do we want to keep? Which parts of this do we actually want to change given that like the goal of what we're trying to build is different. And with move, we mostly like what we saw. The one part that we thought was the one part that we wanted to do, the one part that we decided to change at this point was, you know, the originally move had this data model that was address like the global storage is keyed by this pair of address and type. And this lets you if you're trying to do and then so like there's no notion of like built-in transfers, like the programmer has to handle them. And this lets you implement all these restrictions that we needed in a DM. Like there were like capital controls, like certain kinds of addresses weren't allowed to have certain kinds of assets. And so like you could enforce that by construction. Whereas in typical Web three programming, like you want everything to be transferable everywhere, uh, and you know to be usable everywhere. That's where the, that's where composability comes from. And so we're like, you know, if we started again with a different goal, what data model would we use? And this is where this object data model uh, that we're using now comes from. So the object data model, there's a number of advantages. So the first is that you have native ownership in other smart contract languages, including older versions of Move. Um, Ownership is just whatever the code says, like who, who can access it, that's what it is. But it's like to even understand that, like you have to run the code and see, or it's it's part of a particular standard, like maybe ERC721 would have like an is owner field, but something else would uh, define ownership differently. And so now we have native object ownership, like you, the global storage is cons consists of objects and each object has an owner field on it. That could be an address, it could be another object. It can say this is shared, which means anyone can interact with it. Um, and so this really improves security because if you have an object that's owned by a particular address, it's not even possible to send transactions uh, from a different address that touch that. A lot of Web3 hacks come from stealing, stealing assets. And so if you take the option off the table to implement ownership incorrectly, then you get much, much better security and you just get a lot of things better at construction. So that's very fitting with the, the core move values of safety by default. If there's something where it's a it's a problem where someone can introduce a mistake and you can take it off the take that thing off the table entirely then of course we want to do that so this is like i think by far the biggest advance we've made in move since the early days the other thing the object data model lets you do is you can have explicit object inputs so with move you know if you're calling a move function from another move function and you've got an object on the stack of course you can pass it to that function and of course you can return it this is a bit this is one of the big advances over solidity and we've always had that but before, like the things were very different at the transaction level. It used to be that transactions have to take pure arguments, you know, like integers, bytes, booleans, whatever. But you can't just like call a function and pass an object to it directly. But now with the object data model, you can do that. There's no difference from calling a function at the transaction level or inside of move. Like if you're going to call a function that transfers an NFT, you just pass the object and then it transfers it. And then from the programming experience perspective, your code starts off by having the objects you want sitting right there in the arguments and you start writing your business logic instead of, oh, my code starts off by, I read the object from somewhere, I check some, uh, I do some access control checks and then I'm off and running. It makes your code a lot shorter and it eliminates the possibility of mistakes. And then finally, like that. 
yeah go, go ahead go ahead of course no jump jump, jump in Russia. yeah i've been uh, yeah. on I, <laughs> a question I had even from like outside perspective is do you guys have like numbers for like how much more secure SWE move is compared to like Solidity or other styles of like Rust based programming languages? It's something that we're focusing on right now because I think it's like qualitatively it makes sense like why move is better. But one thing to like the broader Ethereum communities or even like Sonic communities or general communities is when you can say like move is X percent safer than Solidity, it solves X amount of attacks, making you be able to deploy your code X percent better. That's a clear pitch that I don't think I've seen visualized anywhere. Um, so I wanted to know if you guys started any of that and if not happy to work with you on that. So these things are hard to quantify, but the number I would yep. focus on is zero, which is the number of smart contract attack, uh, smart contract hacks on SWE. Um, you know, of course, like this, this isn't going to last forever. Um, yeah, you know, it's like, don't, don't jinx yourself, Sam. <laughs> don't jinx <change> yourself, Sam. <laughs> and prevent programmers from writing unsafe code. You know, it's going to happen. Something like the Kyber attack, like move doesn't prevent that, right? Like this yeah. has rounding, uh, you know, round, like, you know, we have winters against rounding, but like, you know, if someone's going to round in favor of the attacker instead of the protocol, that's very, very hard to prevent. So I think like the, you know, it, it's hard to quantify these things, but I think you gotta like the best number I can think of is like, look at the number of attacks, look at the amount stolen, maybe average that over the amount of time the platform has been live. And I think you're gonna see yeah. another the platforms that use move doing better. Do you think, I mean, particularly the kind of object oriented model, a lot of technical people do watch this, but for the non-technical people, is it just, how would you translate that? Is it easier for engineers to write smart contracts uh, as you've kind of communicated the ability for security is higher, but what does that relate to, to the user standpoint or someone that's not as technical to understand some of these concepts? Yeah, that's a good question. I've been descri describing it mostly from the programmer's perspective or even the like the language design perspective. But yeah, ultimately the question here is like, who really cares? You know, like what what, what is the user gonna get out of it? So I think one of the like one of the things at the sort of design and program perspective that you get, but then it's going to translate to something better at the user perspective is better composability. So you know the there's two I think there's two ways in Swede that we particularly use this in an interesting way and in new kinds of standards. So one is called a uh, one that we've just talked about recently is called closed loop tokens. And so there, like the the problem that we're trying to solve is that if you're a real world asset issuer. Uh, you're going to need a lot of restrictions uh, on your assets beyond what crypto native assets need. You know, if you just use a typical coin standard, you can't say something like, oh, I only want to trade my assets between nine to five on weekdays. Or you can't say everyone who has, who's going to own this asset is going to be KYC. Or you can't say like, I'm going to put restrictions on the amount that can be transferred. These things are just very, very hard to do because the, the standards are designed around crypto assets that are like open loop and sort of no holds barred. And, you know, the, the, utility of blockchains comes from how many interesting assets there are on chain and how much programmability there is. So you really want to improve that and make sure that there, there can be more things. So this closed loop token system is leveraging the way that objects work to have a special object where it, um, it always has to be held sort of at the top level of an account. It can't be wrapped. And whenever it's transferred, uh, the issuer can put the issuer of the asset can apply custom restrictions on properties that need to be satisfied before the transfer goes through all, all of the things that, uh, that all of the things that I mentioned above. You can also put restrict restrictions like this on smart contract usage. You can say, actually, this can't be used by any smart contracts, or it can only be used on this on this deck. So we have an exclusive partnership with uh, and things of this nature. So that that's one thing I think that you know was definitely useful for the, the customers of SWE that's enabled by uh, the, this object data model on that move. Maybe I think passing it. Yeah, so go ahead, Rishi. I think one thing I noticed is like when we're talking to Web2 audiences, the goal for like any blockchain or new programming language or new execution environment is to bring in new developers. So we've done like a lot of outreach to like these folks like from Web2 backgrounds, like Sam obviously came from Facebook and comparing like Solidity and JavaScript. It's uh, like Solidity is like way far away from like what they're picking up in like universities or hacker, like boot camps, whatever, when you come across move, the concept like scarcity, um, it's like very similar to like JavaScript even. I think there's an article from Bixen that's like move is a JavaScript or web three. I think that kind of framing allows people to come into web three and you actually get more developers because it's, if it's similar to what they're learning in like hackathons or university classes, um, it, it's more intuitive for them to pick up. And it's also much more secure. If you're writing Solidity, you only spend hours like debugging your code um, and then like not having the proper resources and not having anything to compare it to. With Move, it's like pretty similar to JavaScript. It's like object oriented. The principles underneath it are pretty similar. Um, it came from a web to inspiration, obviously. 
Um, yeah, I think it's just like a much more intuitive language to pick up for onboarding new developers. And for those that are using movement or the movement layer two, Rushi, are they using the SWE version of Move or the Aptos version of Move? Or do you guys have a custom version of Move that you're using? Yeah, so when we started off, this is probably when only Aptos is live. We, the underlying VM is Aptos Move VM, which is more derived from the DM original project. What we're working on right now is kind of making the VM more universal, adding SWE bindings into it. Um, I think SWE is actually live on DevNet right now, but um, we want to work in the count models um, and make it more one-to-one -one parity. Um, so we're looking at like a ZK Move VM potentially that can take Wasm script from both um, Aptos Move or Move on Aptos, Move on SWE, um, and then EVM compatibility and as well as other compatibility as well. And maybe to Sam, for you, is there, I mean, for those that are trying to just wrap their heads around, what is the core differences between like the Aptos version of Move and the SWE version of Move? Is the Aptos version of the Move in your mind kind of that original uh, design that was created at Meta and that the SWE move has expanded upon it. I don't want to uh, fill your words for you, but just expanding upon kind of the differences in your mind particularly. I mean, I think what you've said is a fair characterization. Uh, the other parts of the, um, how move has evolved um, that I had mentioned besides the object data model or that we have dynamic fields. And so like, this is the, this is the feature that if you have an object, uh, you can attach other objects to it. And this allows you to create rich hierarchies of objects. Like, you know, I've got a character in a game and now they're going to have a sword and a shield that are also objects. And maybe like the sword itself has a, a scabbard that hangs off it, these sorts of things. And then programmable transaction blocks. If dynamic fields are giving you object and data composability, then programmable transaction blocks will give you contract and function composability. In DM, we originally had uh, scripts for this or so-called transaction scripts where it's like, Okay, you publish smart contracts for use cases that are common, and then you write a one-off script if you're trying to do a one-off thing. The problem that we found with that is that you can't really write a script for like often when you're trying to do these one-off things, you're trying to do it from a front end or from an application, and you're not really going to like write move source code uh, from from a front end app, like not typically. Uh, you know, then you'll have to run the compiler. Usually, if you're writing fresh source code, you have to audit it to make sure it's correct and these sorts of things. You know, not the sort of thing you want to be doing on the fly. So with programmable transaction blocks, what we've done is you can have a transaction that calls a move function and then that it returns some objects and it pipes the outputs of the of the first call into the next call. And then you can do that again and again. And you can sort of have, you know, part one of the programmable transaction block has an output that goes into the, the third call that you make. And so that allows you to have this really rich, like ad hoc composition between contracts that don't have to know about each other or be aware of each other. You know, you you call a dex and you get some coins from that and then you're going to go you know do an arb on something else on some other dex that you know that you didn't know about and then neither of those have to write code they're explicitly calling each other there's no callbacks or dynamic dispatch in the way it's just the fact that you have these objects as building block as legos that you sort of snap the different building blocks together uh makes this very very rich so i think those are, those are the main differences is that uh, we have this object data model, we have dynamic fields, we have programmable transaction blocks. There's also a difference in the, the package upgrade model. Um, I, I could talk about that, but I've, again, been monologuing for a bit. No, you're good. I, I love the depth. I, I think, honestly, like being able to compare and contrast, people want to understand kind of these individual ecosystems, but then I always get the questions that are like, all right, how does this compare to this other thing? Yeah. Uh, and maybe to Rushi, passing it to you in terms of uh, um, maybe can you just go into a little bit more of like what movement is? Uh, yep. I think everybody's kind of favorite conversation is really in the blockchain landscape around modular versus kind of these integrated yep. high throughput chains. Can you touch upon why movement has decided to really go down the modular rabbit hole and focus there? Yeah, I think comes back to my background in building movement apps in general, like building the first DEX on Aptos, my co-founder built the first aggregator. Like, I wasn't, when I was deploying testing ready to go mainnet, I had three assets on my decks. It was like the native token and like two other tokens that were alive, um, which made it really difficult to track users because if you only have three tokens that when a new chain is launching aren't the most speculative of assets that are going to get people excited, um, especially at this time, this was November, December of last year. So not the best time to be deploying a new app to mainnet. Um, it was really a challenge for me as a builder and as a team because we were building essentially a dApp that no one really wanted to use besides like forming like an airdrop 
Um, so then the, the module thesis really stuck out because you had like permissionless innovation in the sense. Um, we could take the movie and really enshrine all like the benefits that Sam and a few other folks have been pushing out and bring it to the broader Ethereum community and bring like EVM liquidity uh, specifically to the ecosystem. Um, so now when we're working with DEXs, we're working with Lending Protocols, they're able to list native ETH into a protocol off the bat. They have BDCB through a snowman bridge from the Avalanche system that we built. Um, so you have like Bitcoin now into essentially these Sweet Move and Aptus Move apps. Um, and a lot more EVM assets can be listed. So one of our liquid staking protocols is Banky. Um, they're able to just deploy directly um, AVAX, a stake AVAX, which obviously, especially now, is doing pretty well. Um, so the ability for us to bring EVM liquidity two next-gen environments is kind of the thesis behind movement. Um, the first module, MoveVM, bringing the MoveVM to Ethereum, leveraging Celestia for DA. Um, on the DA side, what we saw is, cool, you can bring a next-gen VM to Ethereum, um, you can provide alternatives, but the bottleneck, especially for fees, is the DA level. So talking to all these DA folks, um, Celestia, Eigen, Avail, um, they really propose a solution where you can cut down like 80, 90% of fees at scale um, and provide a low gas fees environment. And the last step in the Rubik's Cube essentially is fixing the broken EVM. Sure, you can have low gas fees, but then you have an arbitration situation where when network fees spike during high network activity, um, now arbitration is pretty much unusable. When we have a next-gen parallelized runtime, now we can mitigate that. And when we saw the Pith airdrop on Solana, right, it was able to handle those high volume users and didn't like blink at all. Same thing when Sui is going through this transformable phase right now, getting a lot of users on chain, it's not bringing up gas at all. Um, so really able to combine the EVM liquidity that we kind of sticky, if you will, and bringing it to the next-gen environments was the thesis of bringing the first move L2 on Ethereum. So Rishi, I want to dig in on the liquidity point for a second, because I feel like there's something that I don't understand here. Um, yep. So you know, there's a lot of EVM liquidity flowing from yep. um, uh, Ethereum to Sweet these days via Wormhole. Yep. I think it's actually the most bridged uh, destination yep. wormhole, more than even Solana. We're also working on a native bridge. So if you're a builder and you're trying to decide, like, should I build on Sui or should I build on an L2 that's using the same move that Sui does? So how do you actually get better native liquidity on, on Avalanche? Is the idea that Avalanche has better bridges than Sui does, or is there something else that makes it fundamentally easier? So it uses a theme of settlement. Um, we have a trust minimized bridge with a ZK rollup that bridges the execution environment. So you have move VM execution, um, theme of settlement, and actually Snowman, which is from the Avalanche system, is a decentralized sequencer. So primarily like in the past with like arbitrary and base, there's a huge like sequence of downtime issues um, and lack, lack of financial incentivization to actually decentralize it. Because we're able to use a fast finality, essentially sequencer network, we can A, provide value accrual to native token and B, have a decentralized sequencing, which is better for uptime and decentralization and whatnot. Um, but on the liquidity side, because of the trust minimized bridge, we can essentially have native ETH flowing from the Ethereum system. And also because we have even compatibility at the move level, we can have EVM apps deploy directly on top of the move VM. So if I'm an Ethereum user and I've got some liquidity and I want it to end up on movement, can you walk me through the steps of you know how how that gets there? Like, you know, it's gonna hit some smart contract on ETH, then what happens? Yep. So you essentially have the trust minimus bridge from Ethereum to our watching network. So for example, when you're launching scroll, I'm using one of these new L2s, you're able to directly bridge the ETH that you have onto this new Ethereum layer two. Um, we saw that with a blast when they were able to get like 800 million TVL in like a week, whatever strategy is sure, not the best. Um, but the, the point is you're able to jumpstart liquidity off the get-go. Um, so when we're like walking through the user, let's say you have ETH on native Ethereum, you have scrolls, you can see whatever, you can simply use the MetaMask compatibility that you have, put in the theme JSON RPC, bridge over the Ethereum, and now you have ETH on move runtime, and then you can use your favorite EVM apps like Benki, like now targeting the blue chip EV maps um, and onboarding apps from Arbitrum Optimism. So essentially, like Arbitrum Optimism and these L2 folks at the moment have a large amount of users using DeFi apps. We can essentially allow them to deploy directly and move runtime, have all the benefits of move, and bridge the ETH directly to the trust minimized bridge. Is it strictly, I, I, I'm also been very interested in this debate. I think when you integrate all these pieces together, it's my thesis that they'll work better and there's less yeah. fragmentation. Uh, it's kind of like the more, in my opinion, fragmentation that you have with these different L2s, the more that we kind of go back to the traditional kind of Web2 standards. But I'm curious, like particularly 
obviously the move virtual machine is great it does parallel execution uh you need high data throughput i, I don't think anybody kind of detests that i'm curious though like from the modular standpoint is there any particular part of the stack that you want to customize or like today or is it just down the line you think that there's going to be a customization maybe potentially something like what dydx has done and doing kind of the mempool and ram is there anything interesting there that is just like not possible today on these high throughput systems yeah for example like when i was building aptus the bridging i think it was only wormhole at the time and layer zero eventually added um we wanted to use hyperlane at that time because we like the tech and like we would have to wait a for aptus to do the integration with hyperlane um and b like to, for it to get audited it was like i was talking to the team it was like a six month process and i'm like all right this could take forever um we were able to permissionlessly build a bridge to hyperlane we built the first move module um directly a connecting us to ivc so now move is fully ivc compatible and then b now we can directly route liquidity to osmosis um live on celestia and have tia running through our token which at the moment is 10 billion so um it's great for our users um so i think the bridging is the first example of like if we were on a monolithic l1 environment we're at the kind of the mercy of a foundation and their roadmap um to innovate whereas a if i was app i can launch my own custom app roll up move roll up integrate permission let's say with hyperlane use whatever oracle i want maybe i don't use pith maybe i use like origami oracle maybe i want to use another provider maybe i want to use a different indexer so like these kind of changes or only possible, correct me if I'm wrong, with the modern thesis. Whereas if I'm building monolithic environments, I'm kind of the mercy of like whatever is available. So I guess, you know, I think you're saying if you build your own environment, uh, if you build your own L2, say, like you can yeah. choose, like now you're the foundation, so you can choose what bridge partnerships you want to prioritize. Yep. Uh, yep. And on an L1, someone up there is a different foundation who's going to prioritize their bridge partnerships. But I don't see how that makes it so that you will have better bridging stories than L1s. Like, I mean, maybe here's a way to frame the question, which is like, let's ascend disbelief for a second and let's pretend uh, both Aptos and Suite have amazing bridging stories. Uh, let's say like just as good as, um, just as good as any other L1 or L2, then what's the value proposition of building yep. on movement networks? So like in that world where like bridging is all like equivalent great, like every bridge, like layer zero, wormhole, IBC, they're all equivalent. Then they're essentially L1 who would have the best value prop at the moment. But at the current stage, like if I'm building on one of these L1 environments, I don't have that. If I want to use IBC on Aptos and Suite at the moment, it's not available. So I'm completely shut out of the Cosmos network and I have to wait until you guys prioritize it. If I want to use Hyperlane, not possible. If I want to use Oracle provider, not possible. So I would say in that world where all bridging, all Oracle, all, inf all infrastructure are equivalent. Um, and like like the the L1 at the time chose the best providers and partners, then sure, it'd probably be a better experience to build an L1. But in the current state of blockchain environment and programming, that's not the case. Like, I've tried to build a DEX and it was pretty painful. Um, yeah. Got it. Okay, I think that makes sense. So like really the movement thesis is like you all can execute on bridging better than L1s that are using the same execution environment. Uh, I think that's we're able to execute on customizations faster. So like we like we brought IBC to move users, which was something that we've heard a lot from like, and there's like move on Cosmos now coming out. Um, we're able to bring custom Oracle so you can choose whichever Oracle you want, different bridge providers, um, obviously the liquidity thesis, like bringing in e native ETH into the protocol and BCB was something that we heard from a lot of DeFi builders. Um, I would say we can move on customizations faster than monolithic chains. And maybe for Sam, I got Rushi to kind of articulate the modular side of the thesis. I I think you and I are kind of are definitely on the other side of this um, kind of path dependent world. But where do you ultimately see these ecosystems ending up? Obviously, uh, SWE is integrated. Can you kind of talk about the thought process there and why you think integrated perhaps is better over the long term than the modular? For sure. I mean, to me, my view is very, very simple, which is just the there's a there's an equation for the utility of a smart contract platform. That equation is it's the number of useful assets on that platform times the amount of programmability you provide. And so, you know, if the that sort of suggests that you want to put as many assets, as much state, as much programmability in the same place with no barriers between them. And I think like the it's an easy case to make that 
this is the best user experience. This is the best developer experience. Like you don't want to notice the difference between I'm interacting with contract A and it's very seamless, but now uh, I'm going to interact with contract B and it's across it and it's on a different L2 or it's on a different subchain or, or these sorts of things. Um, now, I think one could make an argument that this approach is just like, it's very desirable, but it's just not possible. So that's why like, you know, L2s are sort of a pragmatic compromise. But I think the, when I, uh, you know, when this debate starts, like I always try to have folks like admit, like this is the ideal, this is the thing we would have in the, the world that we, that we would really want. And if you don't think that uh, we should be doing this, it's not because you don't agree with the, the ideals. It's because you think for some reason this isn't possible or that you have to sacrifice something from it uh, in order to uh, something untenable in order to get there. I think the other, go ahead. I've had other yeah, large ecosystems and parties, to your point, Sam, just said that when they started off, they didn't think it was possible. And that's why they went down the roadmap that they had. And if it was possible that you could put this all in one integrated ecosystem, they could do so. I think a lot of those individuals still have a hard time conceptualizing what that world would look like. And that, at least from my understanding and all the podcasts that I've done. Yeah, I think there's a ton of status quo bias from exactly that thing. Like you start with a world that works one way and you're sort of conditioned to believe that the uh, the better world is impossible. And then when you discover that it is, it's uh, <laughs> there's some time. Rude awakening. Yeah. I think an analogy I like to use is like, if you go on the assumption that blockchains are websites, right? Um, ideally, there's one website that I can do everything on. I can shop on Amazon. I can browse Google. I can use OpenAI. I can transact. I can have a super app that I never need to leave and go to like different websites. But Obviously, I have 30, brow 30 tabs up open right now. Um, I'm using a lot of different websites right now. There's a lot of different use cases. Obviously, like there's Google, which I use most of the time, Amazon, which I use most of the time. Those are the three main websites. And I think that's where like, monthly chains end up. Uh, like, you have Ethereum, you have like AppSui, um, you have Solana, where like there's a lot of user activity, but it's also going to be websites that have custom use cases that need to move quicker. Um, that can't live on monolithic chains until like that super app, until you have like one main website that can do everything. I think in today's blockchain environment, there's not a Google yet. Um, there's not Amazon yet. So we're not even close to that. And even in that world, there is still going to need, there's still going to be a need for like, custom app chains um, and custom execution environments. So, you know, I always find that, I always find this metaphor a bit difficult because I think what two and what three are difficult, but like if we force ourselves to say like, what is a website most like in the crypto space? I think it's a lot more like a smart contract than like a blockchain. Yeah. Like if one was gonna say, what's the problem with websites today? The problem is that there's no native interoperability layer between two websites. Yep. It's something that like folks have to build ad hoc on a on a case by case basis. And that's why the web ends up being these series of walled gardens instead of like this beautiful thing where like, I can move my data from one provider to another, or like I can move my finances from one provider to another. And like, there's not barriers and I, I don't have this lock-in. And if that's the view you take, then you actually want there to be interoperability and like the same level of interoperability and frictionless interoperability between as many websites or smart contracts as possible. So under that view, I think uh, you know, it, it looks like the integrated view makes sense uh, because when you start to have different kinds of interoperability, because maybe my smart contracts on a different L2 or, or my state splintered, then you can't have as good of an experience or as rich of an interoperability than if they're in the same place. And I think with the websites, it's interesting. I mean, going back to kind of like Solidity is JavaScript. I mean, in the JavaScript analogy, I mean, a lot of that JavaScript was executed on client side. So it like by definition, like scaled because it's run on your individual computer. I think blockchains are different in how they're scaling on the back end and the node architecture. Um, Maybe Sam, back to you again, like, is there a better analogy? I, I think some people, especially kind of the module ecosystem or even like the DYDXs of the world have said, look, they need to customize some parts of the stack. Do you think majority of blockchain applications or smart contract uh, platforms, smart contracts apps will predominantly be run on one of these high throughput blockchain ecosystems. And then down the line, there's more custom kind of like custom cloud computing that these ecosystems exist. They just have much smaller market share. Yeah, I think they will be run on one, one infrastructure or one common kind of architecture. And I think like a lot of the need to customize your execution environment aspects of the chain comes from limitations in the programmability uh, or in like the native platform features that are provided. It's like as a platform designer, something I think about a lot is like, how can we give folks as much control as they need and not have them run to some other chain to do that? 
So like going back to say this example of closed loops tokens that I was talking about earlier, that's our attempt to say like, we know folks need to do these things. We see that when they do them elsewhere, they're forced to say launch an avalanche subnet because like, you know, they want all the users to be KYC and you can't do that if you're gonna launch on the avalanche main chain. We're like, well, we don't, we still, like people are asking for this. They clearly want to be able to do it, but they shouldn't have to launch a new chain just to do that. Like they should be able to like have a smart contract feature where they can set that up and add whatever other restrictions they want. So that's the way I think about it is like, you definitely need customization, but like you want these to be native features and you want them to be provided at the platform layer uh, as much as possible. Yeah, totally makes sense. And I think, I mean, one of the additional kind of, and I would like to hear your thoughts around this on Rushi as well, is that layer two rules can have kind of faster finality because they're kind of by definition running less nodes or more powerful nodes. Is that kind of soft confirmations uh, something that you think is beneficial? How do you view that in terms of like soft confirmation versus like, hard confirmations uh, defined by the layer one. I think like I'm looking from an end user point of view and I don't think it changes the user experience. Like if I'm like to pull uh, using a DEX on like my role versus a layer one, the what you're really looking at from like a user point of view is like, is it going quickly? Is it confirming quickly? I think the soft confirmations help in general there, but I think it's overstated. Um, I do prefer like the, the monolithic ones where it's like, it's more secure. Um, yeah, I think it do doesn't like matter much to me. I think what mostly about the module thesis like gets me excited is when you talk about users, like if I'm building, if I'm used to Ethereum, used to MMS, and you ask me to like, leave to a different chain, use a different wallet, use different APIs, completely leave my community. Um, it's that I think that's been kind of the struggle that we're focusing mostly on. Um, like for example, like MetaMask, as much as we hate MetaMask, it has the most amount of users. Um, so how can we get MetaMask compatible? I know like Sui is working on Snaps, um, but Snaps aren't the greatest. Um, you probably want to be able, like, we're focusing on having Ethereum based on RPC, fully compatible with all consensus tooling. Um, it works out of the box in Fura, MetaMask. Um, that's kind of the focus we're going on. I think when you talked about like, so, like soft and hard finale to the average user, they don't really get it, nor do they actually care. Sam, do you think uh, soft finality has any merits? <laughs> soft finality. Uh, so I'll tell you my understanding of the term because I think it's kind of new. Or it's yeah, sort of, that's uh, what I'm like. <laughs> we we like new terminologies in crypto. Yeah. So uh, I think this originally came up because on L2s, uh, right, the like true finality takes a very long time. Uh, yep. you know, sometimes, sometimes hours, sometimes days. It sort of depends. Uh, but like from a user perspective, like you're probably not going to hit submit and then wait for hours or days to, to send back a confirmation or you have to do something else. And like as yep. someone marketing an L2 solution, you don't want to advertise that long settlement time. You want to have a different yep. thing. And so like that's where this soft finality distinction comes from it's like oh it's the time that it takes for the sequencer to confirm your transaction and then you know that that happens a lot faster because it's a single machine you're submitting your request yeah. doing some stuff and then so i think but then other folks start to adopt this like uh you know uh Merd is one of my favorite uh crypto presences like you know oh if you have durable nonces you know which which solana does uh, which we does like you have instant soft finality because like as soon as you sign a transaction that has a durable yeah. nonce inside, like it's finalized and so i i think the these definitions are tricky like really anything to do with finality. I mean, to Rushi's point about like, you know, you want to be thinking yeah. about the user and what they care about. I don't think the, I don't think the user really cares about that. Usually the whole like finality narrative came from chains that have reargs. I think what users care about is I send a request. When do I get back the response and to end latency? Like that's what we should really be talking about when we're talking about chain responsiveness and like what we should yeah. be asking for as system designers. Of course, if you get back a response and like it becomes invalidated because you have reorgs, like that's no good. Oh, we don't want to have that either, but I think like really uh, we should move beyond that and talk about latency. Yep. Yeah, fully agree. I, I guess, I mean, one interesting thing is as this kind of modular, um, as modularity not starts to get in, gain hold, but as you can kind of like swap out some of these components like the move VM, uh, you can start to, because these are permissionless systems, there's really no one stopping you from say using a layer two if you want, uh, which could effectively just make the layer ones such as SWE a data availability layer. Can you kind of talk about like SWE being a data availability layer, how you think that will progress over time versus some of these other solutions like Celestia uh, that are trying to pursue or even Ethereum trying to pursue just data availability layers in of, of themselves? 
Yeah, so it's not something that we've really thought too much about or focused on. I mean, the, the one thing I'll say is storage on Suite is really, really cheap. So if you wanted to use it for that, I think it could be a good candidate. But I think like really like data availability, data availability layers are more for like a platform like Celestra where it's like the platform in itself like isn't really doing a lot except trying to facilitate creating layer twos or rollups or alternative execution environments on top of it. Or similar like with some of the changes that are coming to Ethereum to make it easier to support rollups. I think like if you're designing with this as a goal in mind, like it's always going to be better than uh, than something that isn't designed with that goal. For Suite, like our goal is to build the the world's best smart contract developer platform with all the state, all the contracts in one place, and make it as low latency as possible. So it, it might work for that, but it's not our focus. And Rushi, are you deploying to kind of multiple data availability ecosystems, or do you have like a core focus initially? Well, Celestia is the only one that's live right now, um, and the other ones are pretty far behind in terms of coming to mainnet and like announcing roadmaps. So the, the media answer is deploying Celestia for the mainnet solution. Um, but what we're trying to focus is on, we have like some interest from like apps to launch our own app specific rollups. They want their own customizations like I touched on, have their own oracles, have their own indexers, um, run their own environments. So for that, we're trying to focus like a move stack where anyone can use their own um, secure sequencer, use whatever DA you want. So we partner with all the DA layers and have integrations with them. Um, use whatever roll up stack, so ZK stack, OP stack, you name it, just like eight of those, um, and use the movie as the ultimate execution environment. Um, we're pretty agnostic to whatever tooling and infrastructure the app wants to use. Um, there's financial incentives, there's technological incentives, um, and we don't want really to cater to all of them. Um, but for our main solution, we're focused on Ethereum as element um, and then Celestia's DA. Okay, excellent. I guess maybe to both of you, uh, we have kind of gone through this pretty long, painful process of kind of the bear market in crypto. Unfortunately, prices affect quite a bit. Um, how has your kind of thoughts changed, if any, uh, towards the next like three to six months as activity starts to pick back up? I think on my side, it's like the network effects that everyone's been saying that EVM has are going to quickly go up away. Um, like obviously Slaw's ripping right now and like people are like, oh, like I, like if you focus on the EVM, you're screwed. Um, I think that's like what we're going to see in the next three, six months is like people really like, realize like the EVM isn't that sticky. Like we saw Stani tweet about this as well, where it's like people can recognize like even if you like where you module or monolithic like whatever, um, the EVM ultimately sucks and we're all here to try and like remove it and burn it. Yes, I mean, I think it's slower times. There are some things that are quite nice and that like the folks who are sticking around, like, you know, they're they're building with long-term goals in mind. Like, you know, they have ideas for the value proposition. They're like really dedicated to this. Whereas the, the advantage of the faster times is that there's a lot of attention, a lot of new user attention, a lot of developer attention. And so like, I think the thing that I think about that we really think about is just like, how do we, channel that attention productively. How do we convert folks that are just taking a look at this because it's hot and turn them into people who see the who see the value proposition or building the building stuff for the long term uh, and just you know uh, re redirect that energy to, to feed our mission. 100%. In terms of kind of piggybacking off some of your comments, Rushi, I, I do think Solana is kind of having its Ethereum 2018, 2019 moment. And I think at the end of the day, whether it's modular or an integrated stack, uh, whether it's Cosmos or Aptos Suite, say any of the blockchain architectures, we're all kind of competing for developers. Uh, and to your point, Sam, like that interesting state, uh, being able to kind of touch that is the very thing that right, at least most blockchain platforms are trying to strive for. What would you say to like engineers to build in your tech stack versus the other? I can go, uh, Sam, are you going first? Oh, sorry, I thought it was the director of Rishi first. Go ahead. Um, I think for us, we're looking at is, look, if you are going to like live on Ethereum, you really want to stay with an even liquidity, um, just don't use the EVM. Like it's been hacked for $4 billion every year. We literally have like a Kyber dictator like if I'm looking for the next like six months. I do not want another Kyber dictator. I want genuine apps, genuine DeFi apps, gaming apps to be built in next gen execution environments. You can use whatever settlement layer. I don't really care. You can use Ethereum and Avalanche, Binance. I don't care. Um, my main focus and the focus of movement is expanding adoption of move and making a, a superior programming language 
break through. Um, and the way we're angling is like in the past, it's been done through Sweden, Aptos, and other groups. Um, and it's been kind of like isolated approach where people are like, you're either building Ethereum or you're building elsewhere. Um, I think we're working on bridging the gap. You may argue that it's the tech is worse, tech is better. Um, that's not what we're here to discuss or what I'm here to kind of promote. I'm like saying, I want Move to win. And then we can discuss on like soft finale versus hard finale, what that means for users. Um, I just don't want to get hacked for 4 billion every year. Yeah, I, I can definitely get on board with that. I mean, yeah, I guess what I would say is I think we've talked about a lot of the selling points of Highlight for Sweden already. Of course, we've talked about move. We've talked about extremely low latency. We've talked about horizontal scalability. But I think the problem that we're really focused on that maybe other folks aren't thinking about as much or at least like aren't doing as much to bake solutions into the platform is just thinking about user features for user onboarding and basically like what is the like what is the TAM of your crypto power app? So like the way we think about this is like, okay, like you build something amazing. Like let's say it's useful to everyone in the world. How many people are actually going to use it? I would say the answer like at best is 60 million because that's how many people have installed a wallet across all of crypto. And like you basically can't do anything interesting on any chain without a wallet installed today. So it's like, okay, <laughs> that's going to drive away serious builders. That's going to like limit your success, even though you built this thing that's really useful. So, you know, how do we turn this into a tech problem and how do we make it so that uh, that TAM is a lot bigger. And so like, that's really what we're focused on in Sweden. Like with ZK login, uh, you know, you now no longer need a wallet install to do anything. You send transactions directly from Web2 account. So now your TAM is everybody who has a you know, Google account, a Facebook account, a, a account account, these sorts of things. And then with features like sponsored transactions, which we're baking into the, the transaction format, like you get rid of the other big friction, which is like going to Coinbase, scanning your passport, waiting for days and all of this stuff. It's just like, you know, you can send a link to someone who's like one of your friends, like one of your parents, one of your relatives, and like they can just try out your, your crypto powered app on Sweet right away. So I think that's yep. why it's like, we're really just thinking about knocking down all these fundamental barriers and like putting this at the platform level so everybody can take advantage of it. I also think it's often like a discussion like modular versus monolithic. I think it's and like I think if anyone like if you're trying to build a payments app, it's obviously you should build on like Solana Sweet. Like if you're trying to build like the next Venmo, like like you need to build on like where it's like very simple, you just have APIs. There might be a higher barrier to entry, you probably need to raise a little bit of capital. Um, but the next payments app for the next three months and going forward it should be on a monolithic environment. But there's also other use cases that unlock for like layer twos and what we're focused on. Like we're focused on DeFi right now and like we're getting a lot of interest from EVM apps that never would have touched Aptos or Sui or any next gen chain for that matter. And now they're deploying because it's even compatible, they can live and be in Ethereum. We can I was argue about to say you gotta be aligned. <laughs> Whether you argue that it's good or bad, it's genuinely like you need to be into like these EVM apps. I'm sure Sam, you come across it. Like they're like, okay, I still want to live on Ethereum. I still want to be aligned. Is that good or bad? Like that's to be discussed. Um, but I think there's a world where both can coexist, especially now where we need to band together because the ultimate goal is like removing the old dinosaur. I, I think for me, and one the reason why I got so excited in the industry in 2017 when I got involved was kind of that, well, at the, the time it was Ethereum's ethos of like banking the unbanked and yep. getting people into crypto. And I think the reason why I got so excited about kind of the high performance, high throughput paralyzed chains is because I realized, oh, this future will actually get us there much sooner. And yep. I think it's been sad to me just that the industry has not scaled to really where I've wanted it to. And the best thing that we can point to, to your, uh, on the application side, to your point, Rushi, has it really been like USDC payments yeah, and like exactly. web transfers. It's kind of sad, um, but we're getting there. And I, I think these high throughput blockchains are really that next step in the frontier. And that's why I'm excited that Solana is having its moment. I think SWE will have its moment. I think these high throughput blockchains are going to be the next frontier and that, that limelight is now shifting outside of the EVM and the Ethereum focus. Maybe to touch on the topic, maybe you can start with you, Sam. For those that are not like as familiar, what are the key features that you would highlight on comparing like the Solana tech stack to SWE? Um, we know there's the Move programming language. Uh, there's the SWE fast path consensus. There's the object uh, data model. What, what key features do you think are really the differences between these two ecosystems versus all the others? Yeah, so I think the you mentioned you mentioned a lot of the good ones. I think ZK login, which I just spoke about, would be yes. the thing. I really think like that's an extremely important feature to have and have at the platform 
level because this is really just like the difference between having a very small audience for your app and having a, a worldwide audience. So beyond so beyond that at the tech level. So I think I mentioned almost all the ones I mentioned at the tech level. I think Solana also has sponsored transactions, although they work somewhat differently. Uh, that's important for Sui as well. I think latency. Uh, I touched on this earlier, but I think latency, like the fast path latency uh, for Sui, is the, is the best in crypto. We're working on a research project, uh, this Mysticity project, for bringing the latency on shared objects down more. Um, and then I think there's the difference in the scaling approaches, the like horizontal scalability versus vertical scalability. Like we're really focused on. We want to be able to scale by adding more cores and adding more machines and to do that in an elastic way uh, so you can keep operating costs low and solana uh, solana's thesis is famously like you know moore's law is gonna come is gonna proceed apace and gonna make sure that as capacity grows like hardware will always grow faster um of course we we will benefit from that as well but i would say those are some of the other differences and to dive into that just a slightly more brief Briefly, are you specifically talking to like the intra validator sharding where you can add more compute and that acts as like one giant node? Yeah, that's right. We want this to be opaque to to users and to developers, and it's just like operationally, like your uh, your validator could be a single machine, it could be a small cluster, it could be a cluster of two and expand to ten because traffic is very heavy today, and then go back to a, a single machine or cluster of one. Uh, all can you do can you do that at the application level, or is it just at the network level? This is just at the validator software level where it's like you think of a validator as a black box and you don't care about what sort of machine configuration is inside okay. uh, or how it splits up its state or how it farms out transactions to workers and, uh, and any of these things. I see. And maybe to you, Rushi, uh, you have been to kind of like talking high level on like these parallel processing virtual machines. Solana was the first move came and I, I think expanded upon really making uh, programming as safe as possible. Can you talk about, uh, did you look at other parallel processing virtual machines when deciding to build movement or did you specifically just say move is it we're doubling down on the movie ecosystem? Yeah, I've been enduring like probably eight, like I was like a lot, it was beginning to fuel at one point. Um, love like the environment, like really gone to sway. Um, I played around with Monad and like read through the docs recently. And I think that's like gonna kill it as well. Um, and that pursuit suite in Solana. I actually built like an NFT project or a marketplace on Solana too. Um, just to, like the fun of it. I think what ultimately got to me was like I really love the formal verification built into the move game and move language. Um, because when I was always like Solana or like a few of on these programming languages, I still had to like rely on the auditor to make sure I'm not getting hacked or not destroying my entire protocol. Um, for us, it was like, okay, I can build on move and have a lot of these registry debugs, um, all the kind of vectors we're seeing in Solidity and other programming scripts kind of cover for me. Um, so if I want to deploy app to mainnet, um, my barrier to entry is like next to nothing versus in other, even other next gen environments, um, there's still a decent barrier to entry. Perfect. And I, we're kind of approaching time. So maybe as we wrap it up, uh, share the things that you're most excited about for say the six 12 month time frame yeah so i mean i can start on that like the one of the i think topics i originally had to talk about today was the future of smart contract programming so you know i'll talk specifically about like what i'm excited for the next couple of months and with move and so i think in the first five years of move uh, that's that's pretty young by programming language standards pretty old by uh, crypto standards We've really been focusing on building strong foundations in the bytecode format and the verifier because these are the parts that are really hard to change. You know, once you've got thousands of contracts deployed on your platform and they all work a certain way, like it's very, very you can't really go back and you know get rid of old things or add them, or you can, but it's quite, quite difficult. So we're really focusing on improving now. We feel the foundations are quite solid. We're focusing on improvements up the stack. So making lots of improvements at the source language level in package management and the supporting tooling. So you know, in the source language we're Adding enums, there's method syntax, there's going to be macros. Uh, you can refer to packages by name instead of by ID. We, uh, in the, the package manager, we sort of call this like kill all hashes or kill all object IDs, like everything in web user friendly names. And then, sort of, I think it'll be in the next couple of months. Like, you know, one thing is clearly going to change uh, not just the smart contract programming experience, but like the program experience everywhere is like, in integrating LLMs in the tooling stack. I think, like, already, like the copilot like experience is pretty much table stakes for. An IDE that works well, but Move is a language where there's not a lot of code that's out there and not a lot of code that's in, that existed before the training cutoffs of a lot of these models. So I think helping under foundation models understand Move better, 
uh, figuring out like how do we how do we fit this into the the programming stack? I don't necessarily mean like you write English and then an LLM writes a smart contract. I don't think that's a good idea. I'm thinking more along the lines of you write a smart contract and that's like actually expressing a lot of intent. How do you use that to do code generation? How do you uh, how do you use this to build other parts of your app? How do you use this to tweak the 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 end end experience and just like extract a lot more uh, productivity from like the the care the care you needed to do and uh, expressing your smart contract and getting it right the first time. Perfect. And Rishi, what what does the modular future look like in the next six to twelve months? I think from a technical point of view, the biggest issue is if you buy this thesis that's going to be hundreds of rollups, there's no way to connect them. If you want to do atomic swaps between different rollups, it takes forever. It's a pain in the butt. Um, so what we're working on is, A, bringing parallelized runtime to different ecosystems um, and using a decentralized sequencing set to essentially enable one to two block atomic swaps, which should kind of get up a lot of the issues we're seeing with aura books um, and some of the DeFi primitives. And on the kind of narrative side, we're really trying to go pretty hard in the next three to four months, capitalize on the market and see like this alt VM, next gen VM narrative really heating up. So we're really focused on like attacking the Ethereum community and saying like move is here, next gen VMs are here, it's living on Ethereum, we're playing your alignment games, sure. We're here, we're MetaMask compatible. Now what's your reason not to use move? Do you want to get hacked? Um, so yeah, just being very aggressive on the marketing side. I can tell. Well, <laughs> I I hope you uh, can keep pushing the market forward, Rishi. I, yeah. I, I have kind of laid down on that tracks a couple of times and happy to pass off the baton, but really look, appreciate both of you for coming on uh, the podcast. Rishi and Sam, thank you so much. Hey, thank you. Thanks, thanks, Sam. Appreciate, appreciate it. it. Please,